But I'd like to welcome you to the second part of this evening. On the panel, I'd like to welcome René Obermann. He's the CEO of Deutsche Telekom AG and Dr. Heinrich Weiss. Dear Heiner, you're the chairman of the supervisory board of the SMS group, but you've been so only since 1st of July 2013, if I may say, because after 39, having served as the CEO of the said company, you rendered it and took on the job as the chairman of the supervisory board. Thank you all for being with us here today. I am particularly pleased tonight that we've got a lot of participants of our Convoco Forum amongst the audience here today, because as you all may know, Convoco always focuses on one topic per year. Reckoning with failure, collective and individual strategies for uncertain times is the topic for this year on which we held a major forum in Salzburg already. I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Wolfgang Brock, Professor for Aesthetics, Christoph Paulus, who is here with us. He is an expert on state bankruptcy. Uh, Professor Jörg Rocher, whom I can't see for the time being. Where is he? He is there. He's the president of the European School of Management and Technology. And Professor Mellinghoff, president of the Federal Financial Court. Uh, one principle of Convoco is to connect various realms and various areas of thoughts and this is what we want to do. We want to link these fields. We've got two specialists with us today, the former uh, Vice President of Telecom for Data Privacy and Legal Affairs, Dr. Weitz, and Professor Gerhard Wagner from the Humboldt University. Uh, Professor Wagner is also an expert on corporate governance. Well, well equipped, I think, with all of you to have a profound discussion. I suggest to get started. We learned a lot, Professor Gigerenza, from your presentation. Now, what I'm particularly interested in is when we think of the field of industry, can we really take intuitive decisions there when it comes to business decisions? And I'm very pleased to have two different perspectives here on stage, one represented by Dr. Obermann, who is the CEO of a DEX company, and a owner of a company who probably might be uh, free in terms of being able to take intuitive decisions. You're, you, Dr. Obermann, you're not a drug agent, an officer, but uh, what do you think of intuitive decisions? Well, it's very good to have my former colleague, uh, Mr. Balz, here, because uh, whenever I uh, disclose too many secrets <laughs> and I run the risk of being held liable, then I look at him and he either nods or shakes his head and makes sure in this manner uh, that I don't run two risks. A, an owner who manages his own company has got much more scope for action because whatever he does, he does immediately for himself or against himself. Now, somebody in contrast like myself who has been entrusted with the money of other people needs to make sure that the decisions he takes are exclusively geared towards the benefit of the company and towards the benefit of the stakeholders of the company, namely the owners and the staff working there. And he shouldn't be negligent in his decisions, of course, but should gather as much evidence as possible, particularly when it comes to complex issues. But then he needed to give intuition the scope it deserves. Because if we only listen to company result consultants, I just read in, uh, I think it was in a Spiegel online uh, article, who, a consultant who, who just talked uh, and said that uh, Google was the best friend when it comes to making, uh, preparing his consulting work. Now, I could do that myself if I don't base my input on my experiences, I don't live up to my obligation as a CEO. That does not mean that uh, you can just easily take intuitive decisions. You need to be, you need to be very diligent and give uh, intuition the scope it deserves. 
Now, with Telecom, we made good experiences in the past with very difficult decision-making processes. We got uh, various uh, investment decisions that we had to take on billions of dollars. We had a lot of legal problems that we solved together, and my legal advisor always accompanied me and helped me and save me, <laughs> indeed, probably not only my professional life, but also save my private life and my private affairs. Rainer Weiss, well, Mr. Obermann, Mr. Obermann, you said that the major uh, groups, the publicly noted interest, the publicly listed interest companies uh, are obliged to their stakeholders. Now, we are also obliged to our stakeholders. We're obliged to our workforce, to our executives, and I see in a lot of family-owned companies that taking care of your staff, of the workforce, is something that is given more consideration rather than in larger companies where you as soon as the business cycle goes down, people would be dismissed while family-owned businesses think of the social dimension of their workforce and they try to uh, size their company in such a manner, size their workforce in such a manner that they wouldn't have to cut back on the workforce as soon as the first crisis comes up. But what uh, Mr. Gigerenza told us, the best proof for a theory is success and a lot of uh, smaller companies are successful in the world market. Uh, uh, owner-led companies probably have a higher uh, percentage share in intuitive decisions as compared to uh, publicly listed companies with their huge boards and staffs and thousands of managers and executives who optimize everything, who prepare reports for the board, which kind of limit at least intuitive ways of thinking. But a small-scale company somewhere in the urban region, in the semi-urban region, who might not even have gone through an academic education, almost always takes gut-based decisions, uh, very successfully so, only if they get too old either, um, only if they get uh, careless, uh, that then they uh, probably take decisions that are off the mark. But that is uh, at this, uh, very often the more were often the, the result of aging. Now, a huge problem is the inundation with information. Too many executives take, uh, spend too much time on di trying to digesting information that they basically do not need to take good decisions. Mr. Obermann, you're right. The more fundamental a decision is, the more uh, diligent preparation is necessary. You need to gather facts to then at the end also take an intuitive decision. Yes, but the problem I'm seeing is that uh, when it, we take a look at top executives, as a result of electronic media, people spend a lot of time on digesting, taking in information instead of just withdrawing to the forest, having a hike in the forest, thinking and listening to their intuition. Now, why does intuition work so well? You said it yourself, because intuition is characterized by uh, experience, like that uh, turkey uh, example. And the, the bad, the poor destiny of the Turkey is not the rule. Most uh, intuition by uh, mature uh, entrepreneurs uh, are s so well based on experiences that they very often tend to go into the right direction. Now, I don't want to get misunderstood. The uh, company owner who manages his own money has got more scope for action, and it's easier also under the current legal process provisions, um, it's easier for them to just make mistakes when that happens, because he's liable in the first place towards himself. But the uh, Stock Corporation Act, in a, in a way, of course, limits our decision-making scope in these companies. I myself grew up as uh, in the field of small companies, so I know both worlds. In the first 15 years of my business world, as my business life, I took decisions very quickly, very often without the diligent uh, and careful planning and provisioning. And uh, that was good. But then again, in our companies, we've got a lot of facts to deal with where a pure gut space decision doesn't lead you to where you want to go. And uh, if a decision would only be evidence-based, on the other hand, and if you are the CEO, and you, you, you cannot support in such a decision, although consultants keep telling you why that needs to be the case, then it's the obligation not to take this decision because you can't support it and rather uh, stop 
and think about that a second time. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, if it's if you, if you have a board decision to be taken, then the intuition of various uh, board members needs to coincide to take such decision. But there is a minor point which basically came from daily life. Uh, Mr. Gigorenza, you said that those who have a lot of t experience and if they are under time pressure, take better decision when they are under time pressure rather than when they have time to think. Now, uh, think of a shooting in a shooting range. If you talk too long, you basically uh, miss the target. The uh, same uh, happens to decisions to be taken by boards or boards members. If you hesitate too long, uh, you miss the mark. If 70% of the decisions are right, it's okay if they would be taken very quickly. Uh, is something which is being said in the field of military. It's better than taking no decisions at all in the first place. Now, I would like to get back to one point that was mentioned. You said you cannot take intuitive decisions as a team. Now, that's sad, isn't it? Can't you tell your team members, hey, listen, there's something wrong. I feel that. Well, yes, that happens on a permanent basis in our team. We openly discuss within our board, we very openly discuss these topics, and intuition there plays a very important role. But if it were only my uh, intuition to take an investment decision which would be highly disputed, then I always need to think of the fact that I work in a team of board members, and I'm obliged to take decisions together with my team members. I'm not a sovereign, and I manage the money of other people. Uh, this is a moral obligation. We need to show particular diligence and uh, carefulness. You need to think about very carefully whether what you do is, ri is right. And this is something, this is an additional factor that needs to be considered. Yes, I agree, Mr. Obermann, that when it comes to publicly listed companies, the number of defensive decisions would be higher than in smaller companies because these decisions uh, probably are much riskier in the sense that they would devour much more money if they are uh, wrong. Yes, the share of defensive decisions is higher. That is probably true. Now, there's one point uh, that I'd like to get back to. That was a kind of black and white presentation. The presentation of the lack of social responsibility in large companies is not what I experienced. I believe that we deal as le at least as carefully with social responsibility when, with our decisions. We not only look at the short-term requirements of the capital market when it comes to employment policy. This has been done for a short period of time, but this culture is changing. We're stakeholder-oriented. We try to take on board the view of our workforce also to uh, retain our talents much stronger so than we have done in the past. And I believe large companies have indeed significantly improved their culture as for that. I'd like to make a comment. Team decisions. What we've been observing time and again is, well, you've got uh, four or five board members. There's an important decision. The meeting is going on until the dead of night. Everybody's in favor of one decision, but there's one who really finds it difficult to digest. He's got a negative guts feeling on that. This is taken more seriously than a positive guts feeling because it's an alarm signal in a way, very often. Now, one mistake which happens very often is the following. If you ask that person, please explain me, what are your, what are your arguments against that? You simply overlook that intuitions cannot be justified by arguments. The real question is a different one. The others need to wonder whether this one, with a negative feeling, might be the one who's got the largest experience with the problem at hand. If that is the case, you don't ask questions, but rather look for a different investment opportunity. That was one remark. And one question to you. I've got an example of a DAX company. It's not telecom. If it were your company, and if you saw that one third of all decisions are of def that one third of all decisions are of defensive character, particularly when it comes to the lower tiers of management. Would the board then have a motivation to do something against there, against this? Don't you have incentives like that? And if so, if you could do something, what would it be? Well, I think there is a, a disconnect between the perceived culture of 
being allowed to fail. People are afraid of failing, although they will not be punished in an objective term. So our task was, will be that when somebody makes a mistake to motivate them to take a look at what went wrong and what we can learn from this. And this is the task of leaderships and leaders. Uh, otherwise, exactly what you described is going to happen, that risky decisions which would be associated with high investment sums, with with uh, future uncertainties, that these would not be pushed forwards. We need to motivate people as managers, executives, that they should run justifiable risks and to take bold steps. And when they make mistakes, well, not to say mistakes are great, that's nonsense. It's not about uh, applauding mistakes, no. What has to be done whenever a mistake happens is to understand that the mistake has been my made. You need to uh, identify this mistake very quickly and you then learn your lessons. If you manage to do that in an organization, we're not perfect. I'm not saying we are perfect. A telecom is a pretty large organization, but when you achieve that as an organization, you got a good opportunity to bring down the share of defensive decisions uh, significantly too. I think it's very good what you said, but the problem currently is that worldwide, uh, based on Savans Oxley, Oxley in the United States, that the bureaucratization, the legalization of administrative work is getting in increasingly strong. Uh, uh, basically, each decision needs to be uh, underpinned by a legal opinion, which means that no risk uh, would be accepted at all anymore. And the entrepreneurial uh, spirit is going is going to is, is about to 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 evaporate. You know, Thirty percent of the board time in, a, in an American company that where I sit in the supervisory board would be focused on how to hedge your risks, what kind of legal repercussions. Um, any activity might be, is it punishable if you take the wrong decision? And this is already the case. If you if you don't have that mi tolerance against mistakes, uh, the bot cannot work anymore. That's a disastrous development we're observing, observing currently. Uh, now, that might be to the benefit of uh, smaller companies. Large companies get uh, increasingly inert, while the smaller ones as a result, a given more leeway and space for action. But I believe it is regrettable indeed that the effectiveness of large-scale companies suffers from that. Yes, that's exactly the case. I sit, uh, in, I'm a member of the Compensation Committee of the Supervisory Board of American Company. You always uh, first uh, order a report uh, to be drawn by an expert to determine whether the expert report on the comparability of management uh, wages was really uh, well-based. I mean, this is, this is something which uh, it's taken uh, uh, epic proportions in a way. And this indeed is a very clear benefit of not publicly listed companies, smaller companies. Now, that's a conflict we are not able to solve today here. We can only draw the attention to uh, developments because corporate governance has been introduced to basically close the gap between capital and management. But that might have led us into a new dilemma therefore requiring probably some new review processes. How important is innovation for, or rather intuition for innovation? That's another chapter in, well, uh, innovation uh, is important when we think of the large scale development and not uh, incremental uh, developments. If you think of transferring voice over the internet or our smartphones, or if you think of modern mobile, uh, phone networks. These uh, achievements have not developed on the basis of evidence-based experiences, but uh, uh, smartphones, is an, uh, the smartphones, for instance, that show you that uh, these decisions are very strongly intuition-based. So innovations are intuition-based. Yes, I agree. Particularly if you take a look at the developmental engineers and companies, they need to be extremely innovative and intuitive. Now, there is the need to limit that in some way. In many areas, uh, it's still this, uh, the case is that uh, products are being developed which uh, those working in development departments love. 
But these development engineers don't turn to customers and ask them what they want. They just say, we build the best car. That's the best for the customer, and the customer needs to accept it. I mean, we offer them the best. And in service-oriented uh, industries, like in mechanical engineering, uh, machine engineering, we have seen a lot of failures as a result of uh, the fact that German industries and German engineers believe that this is the best that the customers can ever demand, although nobody was win willing to pay for that. So we had to accept major losses in China and elsewhere, in Asia and elsewhere. And uh, this is a new development to put on limits, keep them at a shorter leash, our developmental engineers, asking them to talk to customers before they invest huge costs into the development, uh, which would be off the market. Now, we've got agile development more, uh, methods. Uh, salespeople, technicians, uh, salespeople sit for a couple of weeks in one room, and they develop a new application, a, a new program, so the, the remote control, so that you can uh, use your mobile phone to use it as a remote control for your TV. You can do that with telecom commercial. And now, in the past, you had major business plans and uh, a lot of other things that you needed to uh, develop before you're able to start working on th such developments. Now, this has changed. We have these agile teams that works quite well. And uh, as a result of that, we've got a higher output of innovations. And initiators very often have a high, much higher level of intuition. And they do not think much about theory whenever they trigger of something new. They, they, they say, well, I just talked about that with a couple of people. Uh, users love that. We can do this and that. Well, yes, of course, we're talking about different industries here. Now, uh, we do mechanical engineering, you do software engineering. When it comes to investment goods, the whole story looks entirely different. You first have to ask what the market needs before you start to be overly creative in your approaches. Intuition and innovation. One remark from my side. What I've been observing in various areas is the following. Inhibition of innovation as a result of surrogate targets or objectives. These are uh, this is also a result of short-term planning. Let me take an example from science. There is an increasing development, uh, more in the UK than in Germany, but it's going to come up here too, that science would be funded in such a manner that you apply for funds for three years and another interval of three years and so on and so forth. So in the middle of the runtime uh, of that uh, of your work, you need to make a new application to fund your postdocs. What you do, you do the same again, because that is safe. And if you got a got new project, well, you probably tend to rather bank on what is safe and rather go for the old project. Now, quality control, which is not bad, this quality control has as a result to work as an inhibitor to innovation. The Max Planck Society has got an entirely different strategy. Uh, I, as a director of a Max Planck Institute, have the necessary funds available for my work uh, until the end of my professional life. Uh, as a uh, researcher in the field of human development, I can study innovation and intuition, and I do not have to rely on short-term funding. And I, I can fail, if need be. There are Max Planck institutes which are being closed down. Hardly any university does it. Now, the Max Planck Society says if something fails, we close down that uh, Max Planck Institute. And failure needs to be accepted as a result of understanding that something went wrong, didn't work the way you wanted it to do. And this is one of the reasons why we always been amongst the uh, top three of the uh, top science institutions worldwide, while the best universities in Germany lag far behind. And that shows you uh, the relationship between innovation also and intuition. Yes, uh, we also got a structure where we have long-term innovation and development projects in the sense of spin-off institutes at, at uh, universities. We've got uh, security people who work on topics which are not marketable in the near future work in Israel. And this investment into long-term development work is worthwhile. 
this investment into research is worthwhile, and therefore, while we don't uh, expose them to short-term pressure, but uh, these investments are always linked with certain evidence for success. We need to more or less be able to gauge when such a project uh, will be beneficial for us, and therefore, the Max Planck Institute differs from a company just by uh, its mere institutional structures. Now, you talked about uh, convictions. Now, let's talk about that, your beliefs. You, you need a conviction when you lead a company. You need to know where you want to go, or else, uh, no matter whether a decision uh, would be taken rationally or intuitively, how important is it that you're convinced of what you're doing? Uh, I think these are two separate things, Corinne. Uh, you need uh, conviction in the sense that you have a, a, a vision, a strategy for your company. That comes first. And the decision, uh, whether it's taken more or less intuitively, is basically meant to implement your vision. An entrepreneur uh, without a vision uh, cannot be successful. But is each conviction a vision at the same time? I don't know. Now, this term vision, uh, very it's basically overstretched. Some uh, companies have a vision, they have a mission, they have guiding values, and you've asked their staff, what do you know of that? Uh, what do you know of these, these visions, missions? They say, well, we don't know anything about it because it changes every third year or so. So I think you need to have a simple story. Yes, uh, that's what you mentioned. The retention time of a DAX CEO is five to six years on average. It's almost like a politician. They think in terms of five, six years, he wants to optimize everything within that time frame, but it's go what's going to happen in 10 to 20 years' time is something he doesn't care about. Well, I think that's a very, very general statement, of course, uh, excluding all those present. No, there are the other uh, CEOs. Uh, take BSF and other companies, yes, of course. Uh, there would be well-managed uh, with a very uh, over many, many, many years, but these intervals of these five years is something that you have to reckon with, and as a result of which the share of defensive decisions is enormously high, um, because he wants to pull off something really big within that five years, which means that you do not use a creative uh, opportunity, which would be, of course, necessarily associated with the risk of failure. Well. Uh, this is very critical. We also need to, at times, be in favor of uh, the board members and support them, because their job is not easy at all. Now, may I ask a personal question? How important is intuition in your private decisions? I'm not talking about company decisions this time, but private decisions. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> well, the gentlemen don't know how to answer. Well, well uh, there was an argument I've tried to, um, well, I wanted to, to mention, and that's the right moment. Intuition is good when it comes to decision making, and the best example is how you meet other people. Within the first 20 or 30 seconds, you decide whether you like a person or not. Wouldn't it be awful to listen to candidates who enter a hall and within the first few seconds you would like to tell him or her, please leave, because normally you have to stay there for an hour or even longer. Anyway, it's an excellent example. Sympathy or antipathy are what you feel in the very first seconds. Right. That's what happens. I mean, it's not always the right idea you get of people, but it, it's what happens. Now, intuition in private lives, you, you wanted to know how do we do it in our private lives. Now, I, I've learned from my research in the field of decision-making how to take decisions faster in my life. And it's important to understand that it's probably impossible to find the best option anyway. And even if you had the best option, you'd go on and look for another one because you don't know that it's the best. Like in a restaurant, you go and order something tonight or whenever. Now, in, in good restaurants, I, I don't look 
at the menu anymore because I don't want to maximize my benefit. I follow a simple rule. I ask the waiter. Oh, yeah. Right, of course, you can always eat the same, order the same, and then you don't make a mistake either. But um, you also have the option of asking the waiter, and you don't ask him, what would you recommend? You'd ask him, what would you eat tonight? Normally, in a good restaurant, the waiter knows what's good in the kitchen. Well, thank you for your support. Now, in order to answer your question, my wife has just entered this room. Privately and, and, and in business, I tend to take decisions fast. I mean, of course, there are lots of teams and staff I have in Deutsche Telekom, people who stop me if I'm too quick. And my wife is also someone to, to correct me or to revise my decisions if they are to take too, too, too quick. Now, in our case, it's different. My wife takes decisions fast, which makes me happy. She's very spontaneous and intuitive, and I take longer. And normally, my wife is right. Well, that's interesting, because Professor Gigeren said before that male and female intuition is the same. And that's an interesting message, because normally people t tend People tend to think that women are intuitive. It's negative and positive. But then it's, of course, a pity that men are obviously not considered intuitive. Now, we have done a study according to which women don't think that men could take intuitive decisions. We made a study was a sample of 1,000 men and women, and we asked who has the best intuition with respect to the right romantic partner. And the answering options were the men, the women, or both. What do you think women said in Germany? 90% think that they know better, or at least know it as well as men. Do only 10% think that men know better, and German men don't think differently Either they think I have no idea, but when it comes to stocks, to shares, it's very different. Only 10% of the women think they can go and buy shares, whereas 90% of the men think they are right in what they do. According to the study, there is no difference. If there is one, then women make have more success in buying shares because they use simple heuristics and because they're willing to incur risks. Right. Let's look back at a corporation. What can we do in order to encourage people working for a company to take intuitive decisions? Can you be proactive? Right. Of course you can. Admit an era culture, go and tell people, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal if someone takes good decisions, normally 70 to 80 percent. You can also admit the riskier ones. I mean, of course, you have to double check whether a person is qualified for the job he or she does or not. But normally, you need tolerance, an era culture, and good coaching. And then you can take riskier decisions, of course. I agree. But that's about communication to and in a company that does not have the culture, which is a huge company. Maybe you have to be patient for years and years, and you have to tell people that tolerance and options are on the agenda because um, uh, you cannot simply go and tell people you are allowed to make mistakes. You have to live it to, I mean, you won't achieve anything if you tell people you are allowed to make mistakes, but then they make mistakes and tell you in a board meeting they made a mistake, and then you go and blame them for the mistakes. So you have to have an adequate error culture. And this is about living this culture. This is about communicating. This is about repeating always and the same. And this is about showing people that this is the way you act too. Right. We, all of us, think that there should be better chances for intuitions in our lives, in our companies, in our private lives, in many other fields, as Professor Gigerenza says. So this is a campaign to promote intuition.
Now, this is a two lump sum approach. I, I don't want to have intu intuitive decisions in general because I, I, I want a certain kind of alignment in a company because I don't want to have each and every executive do what he wants or she wants. And then also because people are not experienced enough and they cannot really assess the market and they cannot really assess the technologies involved and they cannot really take the decisions the way I would want them to take them. So I think intuition should be based on experience and people should decide intuitively if they are capable of deciding intuitively. In other words, they require an uh, individual coaching. So you cannot go and tell people, okay, Let's go ahead, decide intuitively, intuitively. Now, this is not about hierarchies. This is not about whether intuition is better than reflection or vice versa. This is about knowing when it's useful to not reflect and decide intuitively and when it's better to opt for a different approach. So you need a lot of experience in a certain field because then you can trust intuition. And then certainly, we are living in a world of uncertainty and you have to know when to calculate risks. And in the end, actually, it's always gut and mind. In the beginning, you have lots of data, but then you realize that in a certain moment, in a given moment, you have to assume the responsibility. If you want to elaborate a good decision, you have to have a team, but the team should not be too big because then you have too many vested interests in your teams and too many people who follow their own decisions. So you have to have a small team and you have to have a certain, have to have a certain deadline for each and every conversation, a certain deadline, a budget. And if you realize that you have not reached a solution after four or five hours, you don't go and discuss another four or five hours. You decide to come back the next day, go back and discuss it again tomorrow. Committees talk themselves out of risk is what the Americans say. And there you are right. The bigger the group involved, the more people who have to sign a decision, the softer it gets. You water it down, so to speak. I, I would like to invite the floor now to, to make statements. I would like to come back to the um, stock exchange uh, law f from 1994. Maybe from the audience, you can give me an answer. There are several things I have on my mind. Mr. Obermann talked about the incremental optimization and intuition in a collective body. Obviously, in a collective body, the share of intuition is not distributed equally and the um, The um, uh, board members, and in particular the CEO, has to make sure that there is the right mix. But then, of course, we also need authority or, as we call it, empowerment. In other words, you have to have those who take a decision in a very sober, calculating way, and they need to know when intuition is the right way to go. And this is what I experienced in the board together with Rene Obermann for four years. If you miss the right mix, you get the disruptive moves. And that makes me think of the double helix in chemistry or biochemistry an innovation people would not have found had they went on and carried out more and more experiments. As we all know, the inventor or the discoverer of the double helix found it while playing 
tennis. And the same goes for Einstein's theory of relativity. So you need to have the um, right mix. And then, of course, you have to double check it. And of course, this needs to be part of your corporate governance, i.e. the stakeholders and the shareholders are to be involved. And of course, the shareholders are not intuitive because they are many. And when it comes to the aggregation of chances and risks, and here I hope that you agree, dear professor, an asymmetry happens in their minds. Sometimes we call it fiscal way of thinking, it's worse to have one million realized than losing two million. So this is a particular approach of shareholders, and then shareholders often want to have a steady income instead of future chances. Of course, you also have courageous shareholders who are eager to invest. But the shareholders of Deutsche Telekom, I believe, are more conservative and opt rather for the incremental rational approach because they shy away from risks and they want to achieve small goals instead of always hoping for the big goals. Now, I'm not sure whether this is what you wanted to hear from me, Mrs. Flick, but maybe you also wanted to hear that there is also an instinct we have to consider when it comes to the perception of dangers. I've been with Deutsche Telekom for 20 years. And um, I had opportunities to protect the companies. And this because I had an instinct with respect to chances and dangers, i.e. running a car for more than 20 years without ever having an accident is what I've done. But then, of course, you are right. There are much too many networks that bind us, much too many legal prescriptions and liability prescriptions. We do have minor possibilities to opt out certain rules that help us feel more freedom. But uh, I think all in all, we also need a revised legal policy because we are imprisoned by a jungle of standards always based on the assumption that we have to protect the public and the shareholders from wrong decisions which is understandable. One more thing concerning defensive thinking. I mean, this is not always about self-protection or self-defense. Because there is also an organizational approach as far as self-defense is concerned, i.e. people fear to do what cannot be undone i.e. unless there is a plausible chance to undo it or to be able to undo it, people don't want to take irreversible decisions. And then, of course, you deal with ordinary risks like personal liability and economic risks, and that's all. Well, thank you, but there are movements that try to overcome this approach, but in the banking world, the situation is the opposite one, more corporate governments, more control. Professor Rochol. Studies have shown which banks have suffered most in the crisis. And the assumption that it would better an enterprise if it has to undergo a crisis was proven wrong. Let me give you an example. Studies have been made with respect to the independence of the supervisory boards in companies and in banks in particular. So people check whether um, 
representatives of banks are personally involved in companies, and people tended to think in the past that it's better to have no links with a company, to not with companies, to not be involved because then you have a sober, a neutral, an objective attitude. But then in studies, we've seen that there, where there was the independent perspective, the independent glance at the company, an unbiased approach, there was often a major lack of ignorance with respect to what was happening in the company, i.e., these banks and companies were um, Worse off than there where there had been personal links between banks and companies. Now, what can we learn? I'd like to contradict the concept of intuition because there might be reasons that seem to make sense intuitively, but there are no facts to um, prove that the decision you take on the basis of given criteria is the right one. The question is, what can the regulators do intuitively, empirically, or not do anything at all in order to offer more freedom? That's my question. Now, let me tell you that I'm closely cooperating with the Bank of England on a project with the title Simpler Heuristics, sorry, Efficient Heuristics for a Simpler World of Finance. Since the 1980s, we are dealing with risks which cannot be calculated completely, and we are dealing with uncertainties. So value at risk in order to um, know how much capital is needed does not work because the system has never been the right one to uh, predict a crisis. So we need um, more security on the basis of simpler rules. Uh, I used to work with Mr. King, the former governor, governor of the Bank of England, and I asked him what set of simple rules could offer more security, not complete security, but more security. And Mervyn King said we should not have a leverage ratio of more than 10 to 1, i.e. the relation, the ratio between your debt and your capital. So not more than 10 to 1, because you cannot really protect the values in the given world and you deal with a lot of uncertainty. So that's very different from what the uh, finance world tells you. There are lots of parameters and you cannot really assess them or estimate them or calculate them. That's the Markowitz example I gave you. So we think it's possible to create more security than we have today, but you have to rethink. Well. I liked what you said about banks, the independent um, uh, supervisory board members or those who had no idea of the business of a given company did better than others because the um, ECB and other uh, banking unions hire hundreds of uh, inspectors to control and check the banks. So I feel relief in view of what you are telling us with respect to independence and knowledgeable supervision. Now, we are also talking about the state and the taxpayers who had to intervene. And obviously, the state had the feeling that it had to be involved more. But that's not always productive, counterproductive, maybe even. I don't want to speak about banks. Ladies and gentlemen, your questions. And there is one more. And please tell us your names. My name is Wagner from the Humboldt University. Now, I wanted to respond to your question whether the current liability clause of the Stock Corporation Law, paragraph or Article 93, whether this uh, article inhibits uh, intuitive decisions. I am skeptical whether this is really the case because 
this provision expressively and this is the very essence of this provision gives you a lot of discretionary leeway for entrepreneurial decisions and this leeway has the aim uh, to take decisions in an uncertain world in the sense of Professor Gigerenza. Now, this uh, culture of expert opinions probably is less a problem when it comes to wrong decisions, but as Mr. Gigerenza uh, put it, it's a waste of money ultimately because you just buy justifications for decisions which were taken for other reasons, reasons you might not be able to point your fingers to and which have already been taken. It's basically like a tax imposed on the company which we could do without if only you did away with this uh, culture of expert opinion. So it's less of a decision-making problem. Now, there is one to be added. One decision-making problem which hasn't been raised today but which very closely connected to intuitive decisions is the ah, the decisions by judges. In the hindsight, when something went wrong, they have to take a decision on whether a mistake had been made ex, made ex ante. And this is very often subject to a hindsight bias. Just through the mere fact that things went wrong leads you to the assumption that you needed to be able to foresee ex ante that this was the wrong decision. There might, was the IKB case where the board was alleged to have solidly relied on ratings, although the co uh, credit worthiness uh, marks of the structured securities was something that not only IKB relied on, but the entire banking industry and the regulation authorities also use these ratings as a fundament, as a basis for their decision. Now, if this is ex post being uh, uh, characterized as a mistake, then we have to say that these judges uh, listen to their intuition, intuition uh, unjustifiedly. Now, it, the uh, impression uh, comes up as if Article 93 of the State Corporation Act as if that would be the only legal provision which uh, defines our liability risks. There are a lot of other provisions, legal provisions, which uh, partly overlap. And if you're an American European company, if you're active in the United States, then you, you have to confront yet another entirely different level of complexity. It's true to draw the attention to the fact that uh, there is such a provision which is meant to be a business judgment rule and which should encourage the board to carefully consider the decisions they take. But there are a lot of other legal provisions out there too. Now, in practice, and this is in keeping with my experiences, not only because of Dr. Balz is making sure that we run our business accident free, but because we also gathered our own experiences, I can tell you that we all got more careful. Everything would be reviewed uh, two times, three times, uh, not only ex post to justify what you've done, but also ex ante to document that your decisions were well informed. Now, a lot of board members are in a company for three years uh, with my 12 years. Uh, of uh, being a member of the board. I'm almost a fossil, particularly having worked there for 16 years. Now, most have a longer, shorter lifespan. They don't want to make a mistake. And this is not entrepreneurial. This is just impeding developments, and that's not good. Not good at all. No, particularly if you take a look at judges who uh, try to make a, find a ruling, find a decision about whether your decision was state right, right or wrong. Now, I have full respect of the field of judiciary, but they do not have, judges don't have the expert basis, the knowledge basis to be able to assess the decisions taken by board members. Now, there are a lot of questions coming up. I'd like, please, audience, uh, I'd like to, to ask you to uh, keep short with your contribution so that we can give the floor to as many people as possible. Christoph Paulos. Yes, I was asked to be brief, and therefore I'd like to briefly highlight what I already mentioned. Your dispute at the very beginning, uh, you said because you work in a publicly listed company, you're not family owned, you, you, you mentioned moral. But it's not about moral, it's about lawyers and judges. Now, please let me finish. Uh, 
who basically use Article 266 of the Penal Code. I do not like to contradict my colleague, but it's not a culture of expert opinions which is uh, rife, but it's just making sure that you hedge your risk against liability issues. And it's uh, particularly lawyers who are uh, mostly to be blamed for that creation of uncertainty. Well, uh, um, embezzlement uh, wasn't used very often in the past, but it kind of is currently experiencing something like a renaissance. You mentioned 260 of penal code. It's about embezzlement. And there was a question this time from a lady. I'm from the Helmer Society, and my question goes into an entirely different direction. It refers to education and culture. On the one hand, we're seeing that in various different cultural spheres, decision-making structures evolve, which also, of course, differ. And they might differ strongly from what we are used to here in the Western world. And therefore, my question refers to the experience of the panelists. How do you experience that here? How might it contrast to what you find in other countries? Another aspect is education. Modern companies educate their own managers. The same is true for a company like Telecom, but the same is also true for uh, scientific institutions. And the taking decisions is something which is being taught and the preconditions and framework conditions under which decisions have to be taken is being taught. Now, cultural differences and education, to which extent does all that play a role when it comes to taking decisions? If only it were the case that how it were taught how to take decisions. Now, I'm under the impression that this is something which everybody is doing, but nobody talks about that. And we don't have systematic training as for that in science either. And to lead a Max Planck Institute, you do that on the basis of a blend of good people and a little bit of intuition and the will to take on responsibility. Now, what you said about judges before applies here too. Today, judges not only in the United States, also here, they have to cater for aspects like the hindsight bias, meaning that you're always clever when looking back. The illusion of uncertainty is another big problem, important problem for judges. There was a case in Germany where a physician who uh, didn't give the advice to do mammography, uh, uh, breast cancer screening, uh, who didn't advise her to do that, was sentenced uh, to pay a fine, which is incredible because we still do not know whether uh, breast cancer screening really uh, does any good at all. And we talked to federal judges in the United States, and most of them didn't have any training in terms of uh, hindsight bias and many other elements that might influence their decisions. And judges deserve much better training that they receive. Now, do you want to answer regarding the question of cultural diversity? Now, if you take a look at young companies who are just in the third, fourth round of their startup funding, seed funding, there this diversity becomes apparent. For the United States, it's just something mm, that they take for granted that they've got these, or, uh, that you've got a cash plan rate. When I set up my own company, I had to turn to the bank and ask for a loan to be able to fund my stocks. But the culture has changed. It started in the United States and has also taken hold here in Germany bit by bit. Uh, everything started in the Silicon Valley, but we find that more uh, firmly anchored in, in Europe, stronger so in Berlin than in other European countries. But we see a different form of risk-taking emerging and also a different form of willingness to fail. Uh, I was in Valendar and spent an evening with young entrepreneurs, and some of them just uh, proudly uh, reported about their failures. I never seen that before, and they had a discussion about what they learned from that failure. So the willingness to take risk is on the rise as a result of the kind of ecosystem comprising uh, companies, venture capitalists, and 
the willingness to fund young companies, which is also being supported by the society at large. It's positive. Now, I don't have that many mandates as a supervisory board member, but I don't see much of a difference anymore between United States and Europe. Yes, yeah, we're changing here in Europe indeed. Uh, if you ever went through the through the bankruptcy process in Germany, you basically didn't get any money anymore. Uh, but uh, if that happens to people in the United States, they always get a second chance. And if we in the future are going to have a head of the Liberal Party being an entrepreneur who also failed, who also went through a bankruptcy, that probably might be an indication of that change. Now, judges have been mentioned various times, and therefore it might be just fitting for a judge to take the floor. Now, it's not the judges who basically uh, use this vacuum of law and take decisions because they just feel like taking so. No, there is a parliament which passes acts, and these acts, these laws have to be applied, have to be implemented. And it's the obligation of judges to exercise that law. And if that law needed to be changed, then the criticism needed to be directed not against the judges, but against the parliament, the representatives of the people. I absolutely agree that we are absolutely over-regulated in the most various fields of life, be it the municipal level, the national, the European level, or if you take a look at the level of the G20 states, or if you take a look at the tax law that shall be regulated on a UN level, I just wonder how that should ever work. But it's not the judges who claim, who make these claims, who make these demands. We would be grateful probably with having less laws. But there's one question to you, Mr. Gigasinter. What I've been concerned about uh, is the question, what is the basis of intuition? Two questions. You talked about experience quite often. Now, there are companies who went public basically to create a public uh, uh, stock for the people. Now, today, you would say people have become more cautious when it comes to buying shares and stocks. Now, if you ask them for a rational decision or an evidence-based decision, one could say that this intuition is not right. It is not the right position to support and promote a, the economy of a nation. Uh, uh, how can you identify intuitive decisions which are not right? Very often we see a development where in family-owned companies, for instance, where, uh, where the owner gets older and intuitively he does a lot of th things when growing older, but you see the uh, consolidation of developments where you wonder whether these developments are really right. Maybe this intuition uh, needs to be exchanged, replaced at some point in time, because that intuition from a certain point in time on might not be right anymore and accurate and conducive anymore. So is there any kind of uh, criterion to determine which intuition and intuitive decision is good and which is not good. I mean, if you get the youngster, a fresher in a company, you want him to learn first before taking an intuitive decision. So how do you identify a good intuitive decision and how do you identify the need for correction? That's a good question. Intuition normally is based on a lot of experience. The drug officer that I talked about in the very beginning learned with an experienced DA agent for 10 years, they worked together for 10 years in this international airport. Who didn't know himself how it all works, but just by showing, he indicated. You know that? You see that man there? You see that man there? And then he learned how to identify these people. It requires a lot of experience, and somebody without experience, the intuition of this man or this person cannot be good, as good. Now, you talked about John Doe in Germany, shareholders, uh, share owners. Uh, Germans don't have many experiences with stocks and shares and don't have many experiences with finances and uh, finance issues generally. We could change that if we taught not only mathematics uh, and other abstract things and beautiful things that you normally tend to forget when you leave school, if only we had the courage to change the content that we teach, how to deal with health, how to deal, 
how to handle digital media and above all how to also handle finances that would change things intuition is never safe but it's a good opportunity to be the right decision if the person taking this intuitive decision is experienced now you talked about that old f uh, owner of a family owned company there's one thing that needs to be kept in mind the best experience doesn't help you if the world has changed in between if globalization has come about then this old experience that has emerged from before that change can be lethal well i'm older than 70 years now and i've done my job 40 years pretty successfully so but i'm now uh, f uh, finding out uh, that young people see things in a much more interesting manner much more efficiently and i don't try to be their teacher then anymore i've seen so many entrepreneurs company owners who built up something for decades very successfully and who then successfully equally successfully so dismantled their company in the last years of their activities that was a very frank and honest contribution Well, I, I don't want to be disturbed. Uh, in times of uncertainty, more intuition. That seems to be a conclusion. We know from centuries of thoughts about the capacity of physicians to come up with diagnosis or about the capacity of teachers that you can't teach it. You can't learn it. There, There is a precondition for making use of intuition in a meaningful way however you may want to call it. It has something that has something to do with the personal structure. It is not only something to do with experiences in the sense that you've got made your experiences uh, with some events. No, you can't teach that. You cannot learn that systematically by only by education. You can't achieve that alone by education or even not at all. You need certain preconditions that you find in the person him or herself when it comes to rational decisions you know what what uh, which decision to take you know when you will be held accountable and liable and all that but to give room to for intuition you need to have other requirements that are fulfilled and uh, yes uh, we can do something we want to do something but you need to be careful not everybody has it with teachers it's very clear that they need to have something which is very difficult to point your finger to the same is true for physicians it doesn't work like that and that is something that we need to consider and keep in mind before we basically take the roles of advisors claiming that everything is basically something that boils down to not more than attitude it's not right no, it's not about attitude it's about uh, experiences long years of experiences uh, coupled with feedback you probably are right that there are certain characteristics that you need to find in the person him or herself but we don't know these what we do know is though that most of us if you subject them 10 years to a relatively constant experience let them work for 10 years on an on a matter for long years like that drug agent that i mentioned that on that basis you can improve intuition uh, significantly. Mr. Kulati, we got a lot of questions. We need uh, short answers. Mr. Gigerenza, you mentioned heuristics as being one essential element of intuitive decisions. Another uh, attribute would be um, a set of standards, a set of guidelines that you use. Now, my question, does all that have an influence based on your uh, studies if you have such a set of rules and values and mr weiss mr obermann do you believe that uh, do you have these guidelines how do these guidelines and set of values come in when you select your executives for your companies heuristics simple rules create a culture of values and they create an atmosphere i'd like to give you an example to illustrate my point we understand leadership as well, a good leader has got an adaptive toolbox of rules, a set of rules, which the person uses intuitively. And if we're dealing with a good leader, they know when to use which uh, values. One rule might be recruit good people and let them do the work. This creates quality. 
Recruit good people creates quality. Let them do their work creates trust. Now, this is just one example for such heuristics, which are closely connected to the values that you produce. You produce not only values, you produce a climate. And there's a rule, for instance, of the Max Planck Society. You recruit top-notch scientists after a long search process. And then the person can do what they what they want. They need to be excellent. Now, if we take a look at universities, you see that they have an entirely different uh, set of rules. They do not create quality, nor do they create trust, because they take short-term decisions. We need to keep short, Mr. Gigorenza. Yes, in addition to everything that has been said, it's correct to say to make sure that executives need to stay curious until the end of their professional life. They need to be able and willing to keep on learning. They shouldn't be self-satisfied. They shouldn't lean back and uh, think they know it all, and that helps you to preserve the healthy level of intuitivity. You ask for the set of values. Yes, we do have them. We have five central values, which uh, include customers and reliability and many others, which are very clearly articulated and spelled out, and which each staff member uh, pl uh, sees that all that plays an important role in their professional career. Our assessment uh, system is based on our value system. Does it lead to perfection? No, it hasn't been done to perfection, but it has been uh, widely s developed and sophisticated, and that's already a very important advantage for us. I'm Philipp Hübel. I'm a teacher of philosophy at the University of Stuttgart. Intuition is felt knowledge, you said. Now, if you want to have a critical attitude, you have to underline that there are different ways of knowledge or different types of knowledge, empathy, knowing people, um, explicit or abstract knowledge like a broker needs to know something you learn. Maybe you are more vulnerable with respect to errors depending on the knowledge the drug officer might see someone and think well i think there is something wrong about this person but then he thinks so because he feels reminded of his uh, mathematics professor at elementary school so don't i have to double check always yes That's a nice brief answer. Right. Of course, I have to check whether it's good. I have to test it. Professor Gigorenza, am I right to say that you can learn from mistakes you make there where mistakes can be undone? The military service, someone dies, you cannot change it. But if you know the answer before you are a prince, the prince of Hamburg, and otherwise you are a military commander in Kunduz. Well, in order to answer your question, first question, no, I don't agree. Because even there where it's about life and death, you have to dare into the intuition because otherwise you don't decide at all. And the example I gave, the, the miracle of the Hudson River, if you remember, is such a decision about life and death. Of course, you might not look good if it's going to fail. Now, the Kunduz example is an extreme one, but actually this is about responsibility and about us assuming responsibility and of course we never know for sure what the future will be so we have to be courageous and assume the responsibility and also um, agree to be responsible there where it fails my intuition tells me that we should have a glass of wine now which is i would like to thank the panelists professor gigrenza for your wonderful presentation and I would like to thank the audience for having listened. I've learned a lot. I think you have learned as well. So please feel invited. Thank you.